Theology proper is the study of God and His nature. It also includes creation, however, we'll be dealing with creation in a different lesson. The, our theology proper is divided into three parts. In the first part, we'll deal with introduction and the metaphysical attributes of God. In the second part, we'll deal with characteristics, or what are called non-moral characteristics, and moral attributes. In the third part, we'll deal with the Trinity. Our objectives for this part of Lesson 3, by the end of this unit, you should be able to 1. Define the attributes of God. 2. Write two reasons for studying the attributes of God. and 3. Identify correct theological statements concerning the metaphysical attributes of God's nature. An Introduction to the Attributes So what is an attribute of God? The use of the term attribute in its technical sense means that it is something that is attributable to the very nature of God, or His essence. An example would be holiness. That is, an attribute is something that is true of God's very nature. It is some truth about God's nature regardless of His relation to creatures, or regardless of His relation to creation. A characteristic is something that can be said of God or something even attributable to God, but it's in a general way. For example, ineffability, that our language cannot exhaust the nature of God or describe God in its entirety. This is something that is true because God created creatures that think about Him. And as they think about Him, they come up with characteristics of things to say about Him. But these are not things that are necessarily attributable directly to his nature, such as an attribute. Other things that we might say about God would involve his activities. An example of this would be wrath. We can't attribute wrath to the very nature of God because it would be contrary to an attribute of his, which is love. But we can still describe God in terms of wrath or anger. But this is only used in a metaphorical sense or in an anthropomorphic sense because it seems that way to us. And please understand that two and three, that is characteristics and activities, are not less important than number one, an attribute. But it is important to understand that they are not directly attributable to his nature and are only considered because of the creature and his relation and interaction with God. And as we'll see, all of these are used in scripture. So we begin our study with a question or a problem. Are God's attributes one or many? The problem is this. If God is simple, as we have shown in our prolegomena with regards to God's pure actuality, that is, he is absolutely one in essence, how can he have many attributes? Our reply is that this confuses many things that can be said about the one being of God. It's important to understand that humans are used to describing things that are composed, and all of our language is geared towards describing things that are composed. But we have never experienced God face to face. We have never seen a being that is pure act. And hence, our language is only geared towards describing things that are many or multiple with regards to composed beings. So here we have a problem of the intellect. God has different attributes, things that can be said of him that are true of his one being. And no one thing said about him is completely exhaustive. And since we do not know God directly, that is, what God is, since we have not experienced him face to face, our mind must separate out the different things that can be said about the one true God. Hence, it is a limitation of the human intellect when trying to conceive of God and not a problem for God himself. Here are some wrong concepts with regards to the attributes of God. Number one, we should not think of the attributes of God as a collection of attributes that are in God, such as the circle with the different attributes inside of God. And second, we should not consider attributes as being something that is added to the nature of God, such as we consider one attribute and then we add another attribute. These two incorrect illustrations make attributes into properties or some type of platonic form 
of a self-existing eternal or abstract object. And that's not what we mean by these attributes. They are not parts of God, or not existing in and of themselves, apart or separate from God. The correct conception that we should have is this. Consider this a wheel with a hub in the middle. As we, in our intellect, go through the different attributes of God, we walk around the wheel considering one attribute at a time. Because that's the only way that we can think about God. We do not know the center, that is, how the attribute is in God, in his nature. We do not know the center, what God is. We only know the outer concepts considered by our mind one at a time in their relation to each other. The attributes individually considered are not his very being itself. Every attribute instead is a different way that we as finite beings think and try to understand God. The center is truly a mystery for us. We don't know how they exist in God since we have not seen him face to face. So how are the attributes predicated or ascribed to God? This we've already dealt with in our prolegomena, but let's review the definitions of the three options that are before us. The first one is univocally. This means entirely the same way as it is in creatures. The second one is equivocal entirely different way. That is, there's nothing common between what we say about God and the way that God really is. And the third one is analogical. That is, what we say about God has something that is common or the same between man and creatures, but something that is completely or totally different as well. And I would add that most of the objections to the attributes of God, or even to each individual attribute, such as simplicity, for example, is a failure to understand this type of predication that we're making. Usually it's understood in one or two, and it's not understood in three, which is analogical. So let's clarify analogy. Analogy clarified. The other options, univocal and equivocal, have to be rejected because they're self-defeating, and we've already shown that to be the case in our prolegomena. All proper statements about God must be analogical. And the basis for this is that God created creatures like himself. There's something in the creature that is similar to what is in God. So the types of analogy that we can have. The first type is referred to as an extrinsic analogy. That is, only the effect, not the cause, has the characteristic. An illustration of extrinsic causality is when we drop an egg into boiling water in order to make a hard-boiled egg. When I put the egg into the water and I boil the water, the water is able to produce hardness in the egg because of the heat that is transmitted from the water into the egg. The water does not have the quality or the characteristic of hardness, but it's able to produce it in the egg. Likewise, God is able to produce effects that are not intrinsic to the very nature of God. This would be, for example, having material bodies. God can produce us with material bodies without himself having matter as a part of his nature. And he does this by his power of extrinsic causation. The second level of analogy is intrinsic causation. This is when both the effect and the cause has the characteristic. For example, if I have boiling water on the stove, and I drop an ice cube into the boiling water, the boiling water is able to create the ice cube into a liquid. The very quality that the boiling water has, an ice cube does not have. In this case, it's an intrinsic causation, again, in which the cause and the effect are able to have both characteristics. For example, man, an immaterial aspect to his creation, and God is immaterial as well. Hence, both man and God, the effect and cause, share the same characteristic. And it must be the case that three follows with regards to our understanding of analogy, that the cause must exist intrinsically, or it cannot give what he does not have, or he must possess the power extrinsically to produce it. And of course, there are some things with respect to analogy that God cannot give, or cannot produce in another. For example, he can't make another infinite being or another pure actuality being. That's impossible. 
So with these basic types of analogy and causation in place, a further clarification is called for. We've already indicated this in our prolegomena, but it's worth repeating this clarification here. When doing analogy or considering an analogous concept, it is the case that the understanding or the definition is univocal, that is the same. Something in the definition needs to be the same as it's understood by us and as it is in God. Certainly, even the definition as it is in God can go way beyond our definition and understanding, but there needs to be something that is in common between the two. And second, in analogy, the analogous predication, that is, how it is applied to us and how it is applied to God, needs to be completely different. That is, when we speak of God being good and humans being good, the predication of goodness is completely different. Or dissimilar between God and humans, since in humans it is understood only in a finitely limited sense, but in God it is unlimited. Sometimes the question is asked, why does the Bible use so many metaphors or anthropomorphic sayings with regards to God? And oftentimes it's thought by the beginning student that metaphors and anthropomorphism seem just confusing why don't we just always use the more scientific uh, metaphysical descriptions such as we'll be going through in this class when we speak about God? But metaphors, we should understand, have an important role with regards to Scripture. And I would also add they have a very important role and legitimate place of use with regards to the church and how it operates and teaches about God. Metaphors inform us what God does. They don't necessarily speak directly about his nature. They're not informative as to what the essence of God is, but they are very informative of how our relationship should be perceived or understood with regards to what God does. Metaphors are to be considered indirect and non-literal with regards to the very essence of God, but they do point us to the literal since they are dependent upon us. And metaphors can often produce what our metaphysical descriptions cannot. They can be evocative with regards to us. They can produce emotional reactions in us that are very important for worship and living life. They promote a response from us for holy living that a metaphysical description will probably never do. And so that's why they become very important to the church and the church's operation. Here are some examples. If I said that God is the uncaused cause of our being, that's a metaphysical description of God. In Scripture it says, underneath are the everlasting arm, Deuteronomy 33, 27. That's a metaphorical description. Another example, God is omniscient, we might say, is a metaphysical description of God. And the Scripture says, everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Hebrews 4.13 is metaphorical. And please understand that the church needs to speak about God to all of humanity and make him understandable to all of humanity, from those who are poorly educated to those who are very educated. So it's important for in the context of the church that metaphors be used. Now that doesn't negate the fact that you could have a class that does teach the science of theology to those that desire to understand and to acquire it. But for most that would be involved in the church, things need to be spoken about God in metaphorical terms simply because they're easier to understand. So in the study of God, there's a legitimate use of both metaphysical description as well as metaphorical description. Neither should be abandoned. And often ca the case, particularly within the context of the church, Metaphors may be more fitting to communicate truth for living out life. There are different kinds of metaphorical descriptions of God. There is anthropomorphism. For example, God is described in human terms with respect to having eyes, ears, and arms. There are anthropopathisms, in which God is described in terms of having changing feelings or emotions such as anger and grief. Anthropoiesis says that God is having human actions such as repenting or forgetting things. These are the major metaphorical classifications of what we would find in Scripture. 
There is a danger that metaphorical descriptions could lead to, and they mostly have to do with the fact that people would attribute them to the literal understanding of God's nature, rather than what they are, a metaphor or anthropomorphism. They could lead some to understand God as actually repenting, and this of course would deny his immutability. They might look at God as actually having eyes or a body. This would be a denial of his immateriality. Some might actually think that God is limited when he's described as a rock. This, of course, would deny his infinity. And some might think that God really does think sequentially and know things in advance. And, of course, this would deny his eternality. Others might think that when God is described as angry, he really is angry in terms of his nature. But this, of course, would deny his impassibility. And other descriptions might lead some to see that God has to come down to see something or to know something, and this, of course, would deny his omniscience. So what are the attributes that we need to study? Well, there are the category of metaphysical attributes, or sometimes referred to as non-moral attributes. They consist of the following list here. There are the non-moral characteristics or characteristics that exist because there is a relation between the creature and the creator as considered by the creature. And then there are moral attributes, again, things that are attributable to God because of his nature. And then there are other moral activities, things that God may be described, but because of what he does as considered by the creature, but not something that is intrinsic to his nature. And then finally, the Trinity. And if you can remember back to the wheel with a hub in the middle and the spokes that are the attributes that point to the center that we do not know. It's the Trinity that gets us closer to the understanding of that center, and it's the most intimate view that we have of God that is revealed to us. You might find as you peruse various textbooks on systematic theology, you might find more attributes listed than these. You also might find other things that are listed as well. And as we study these, you might also see that some do seem to overlap with each other. That's expected, and that should be normal. But I think that any attribute that could be listed that's not here is likely subsumed under one of these, or perhaps even more of these, or the attribute that perhaps is listed is more along the lines of something that is metaphorically said about God. But these are the attributes that we will be studying and that you will need to know the definitions of and correct descriptions of. Why study the attributes of God? Well, for one, it answers what we mean by the term God. When we use the term God, we certainly want it to mean certain things and by implication to not mean other things. One of the things that we'll discover as we go along in our study of the attributes of God is that it's really an exercise in negative theology. We know more of what God is not than we do about what God is. I pointed out at the very beginning of this introduction that our language is limited to the things that we know, and all the things that we know are composed things, things that change, things that move. Well, God is not those things, and we've never experienced God face to face, so we don't have a knowledge directly of that which is simple, that which is immutable, that which is eternal and infinite. Only by studying God's attributes or engaging in theology proper, the scientific or theological study of God, are we able to be very precise about what we mean by the term God and what we don't mean by the term God. Second, it answers what is false and true about God. We will come across many different ideas and theologies with respect to God. Through our hearing of theology, through our reading of theology, Come across many individuals that we know have false ideas about God. By studying the truth, we learn what God is and can therefore argue against what is wrong or false about God. Third, it forms the foundation for us to develop a life or worldview of God. One of the principal functions of our life is to think correctly about God, and only by studying theology proper or his attributes. Are we able to gain that correct thinking that forms a foundation for all other views that we will have of things in this world?
and four, it can foster spiritual growth. Obviously, having a wrong view of God can stunt spiritual growth, but having the correct or true view of God certainly can allow spiritual growth to go forward. And related to number four is five, a commitment to what is less than ultimate will not satisfy. If you remember in Prolegomena, we talked about all created things tend toward an end, and humans are no different. We tend toward, toward an end as well, and the end of humans is happiness, and happiness is only achieved in the beatific vision, that is seeing God spiritually face to face. And the greater our commitment is in this life, the greater anticipation we can have of that end. And studying the attributes of God and theology proper can point, it, point us more directly and more accurately towards that end. Metaphysical attributes. Sometimes these are referred to as non-moral attributes. These are attributes that are directly attributable to God because of his nature or essence as opposed to characteristics or acts that are not directly attributable to the nature of God. We begin with pure actuality. We've already linked the notion of pure actuality from our metaphysics through our cosmological argument to the God of Scripture when we did prolegomena. Here we'll see that metaphysically and theologically pure actuality is the same. Actuality is that which is, Potentiality is that which can become. When we consider pure actuality, pure actuality is that which is existence, in which there's no separation between existence and essence. They're identical, with no possibility to be anything other than what it is. In all that is composed in the created and natural world, existence and essence are separated. But in pure actuality, they are the same and God cannot be considered anything that is composed, changes, or moves. One Thomistic scholar, Garigou Lagrange, says, We do not conceive God as if he were a man of infinite proportions, but we conceive of him as a being itself, and we admit in him only those attributes which are derived necessarily from his concept of self-subsisting being. Biblically, pure actuality can be grounded in Scripture. God exists independently of everything else. Genesis 1.1 says, In the beginning, God. Here, God is separated from creation itself. And Colossians 1.17 says, He is before all things. God gives existence because He is existence. He and He alone can give existence to everything else. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the phrase is an idiom in Hebrew for all of creation. And Genesis 1.21 says, So God created every living and moving thing. We have the most direct statement with regards to God's pure actuality in Exodus 3.14. When Moses asks what God's name is, and God replies, I am who I am. One biblical commentator, John Salehammer, says, When Moses asked about the name of God, he was inquiring about more than just the identity of God. He was asking a question about the very nature of God. Within the world of the biblical text, the name was the expression of the nature of its bearer. So it's here in Hebrew terms we have the most direct statement with regards to the nature of God, and it is expressed as pure I amness. I am who I am. Theologically, we can ground a pure actuality of God with regards to his uncausality. God is the uncaused cause of all that exists. We've seen that grounded in the biblical text. An uncaused cause has no potential to not exist. But what exists without any potential not to exist is pure existence. It can also be grounded in God's necessity. Since God is before creation, he is necessary, as is evident from the biblical text. A necessary being cannot not exist. What cannot not exist has no potential for non-existence. But what exists with no potentiality not to exist is pure existence. There are some that have objected to pure actuality, so we'll look at some objections and answer them. If God has no potentiality, some will say, how did he have the potential to create? 
Here we must distinguish two kinds of potentiality. God has no passive potency, that is, God has no potency to be what he is not, since he is pure actuality. But he does have and can give active potency, that is, to do what he has not done. So there's a distinction to be made between passive and active potency. God has no passive potency, but he can give active potency in the act of creation. Some would object, how did God create creatures with potentiality if he does not have any? Here we need to invoke what we discussed in the introduction, extrinsic causation. God can cause things extrinsically or intrinsically. When he does it intrinsically, he possesses the same thing. When he does it extrinsically, he doesn't possess the thing. And so God creates us with potentiality and actuality by his active power in creation. Others will object, how can God act in the world if he has no potentiality? But this question confuses what God is with what he does. God can act from eternity to affect things temporally or in time. This can perhaps be illustrated with regards to my mind. My mind can act on matter by causing my arm to grab a pen and lift it up off the table. Change took place with regards to matter. My arm moved, the pen moved, but no one would say that my mind in any way was changed with regards to all the motion or movement that took place in matter. In a similar way, God can act from eternity without changing, since after all, he is pure spirit and unable to undergo change or is pure actuality. And finally, another objection, how can God act at different times and places if he is pure act? But here we have to understand that God does not act or do many acts to produce different effects at different times. Because God is simple from eternity, he can have one pure act that brings about all of creation and everything that takes place, having it unfold through time temporally. So again, God is not doing many acts at many times. He does all in one single pure act from eternity to bring about all that takes place at different times in different places. The next most important attribute is simplicity. Simplicity means that God is without parts. He is indivisible, absolutely one with no composition. If he had any parts or was divisible or not absolutely one or had composition, then he would have to be categorized as something that is created in the natural world, and he would not be the ultimate being of the universe. There are many today in theology that deny God's simplicity, and will answer some objections in just a little bit. But this notion of God's simplicity is what separates our classical understanding of God and theology from other views. But a denial of simplicity would put you outside the classical understanding of God, put you outside and put you in disagreement with the metaphysics and cosmological argument we used in Prolegomena to demonstrate the very existence of God. The scriptures are absolutely unanimous that God is one in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. Deuteronomy 6.4 Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. In 1 Corinthians 8.4 There is no God but one. Simplicity also demands that whatever we attribute to God is identical with his nature, because again, there's no distinction between his essence and existence. Whatever God is, he is totally and completely. He has no parts. Hence, there cannot be any order or sequence or progression in his thinking or his thoughts. All that he is, he is eternally, intuitively, and exhaustively. Simplicity is grounded in the biblical understanding of God. Isaiah 45, 18. For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, He is the God who formed the earth and made it. He established it and did not create it a waste place, but formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is none else. God alone is unique, and there is none like Him. 1 Timothy 6, 15. Which He will bring about at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen.
and the fact that the biblical text speaks of God being completely other than anything that is created puts him in a unique category of that which is not composed or simple. The theological basis for simplicity, God is not a material composition. He has no form matter composition such as everything else hylomorphically has in creation. God has no form. God has no matter. God also has no accidents. There are no qualities or characteristics to him. He has no size. He has no color. He has no shape, weight, etc. And as we've said, since God is simple, he is not a natural kind or a class of individuals to be found in creation. And denying his simplicity theologically would entail that God is in a natural kind or class of individuals and part of the created order, and hence not being ultimate. So this is the one attribute that separates God from creation and makes him, as the biblical text says, there is none like God. What simplicity does mean is that God is completely indestructible. Since he has no parts, he can't be taken apart. God cannot be partly anything. Whatever he is, as we've said before, he is holy and completely. Whatever we can attribute to his nature, he is completely, since his essence and existence are the same. Some objections, we'll look at just a few of them. One, some will say that uh, simplicity is unintelligible. But this just confuses the notion of total comprehension with apprehension. We certainly can apprehend what simplicity is about and what it entails without having to completely comprehend how God is simple. We should also push back at this objection just a little bit by asking, what is meant by unintelligible? Do they mean it's contradictory, like a square circle? Probably not. A second objection. If God is identical with each property or attribute, and God has many properties or attributes, then how can he be simple? This objection, however, assumes univocal predication instead of analogy. And we've already argued that God must be understood in terms of analogical statements and not univocal, that is, exactly the same statements. That is, when someone develops the understanding of a property or an attribute, they think it is applied to God in exactly the same sense that we understand it. And of course, we've argued that's not the case. It is only understood in an analogical sense. And also, as we've pointed out earlier, multiple attributes are not found in God, since he is simple, but they are found in the human's conception, the intellectual conception of God. We are the ones that have to consider each attribute, and if you remember, walk around the wheel, unable to access how they are in God with regards to his simplicity. These divine attributes, as we go through them, are multiple descriptions used to talk about the one simple God, because that is how they are revealed to us in creation and scripture. And third, how can God be his attributes, or a property, or abstract object, and also be a person if he is simple? This we will answer more fully later when we deal with the Trinity. In fact, I would say that unless simplicity is true, the Trinity of God cannot be true. And I'll have to flesh that out later, but for now, let me make the notion that Scripture never says anywhere that the divine nature is a person. Because if the divine nature is a person, this would make the Trinity a logical contradiction. But I would also point out that in this objection, it begs the question of the attributes being a platonic property or an abstract object. That's not how I've presented the notion of attribute here. These are not separate abstract objects or eternal platonic form. If you remember when we talked about the wrong concept of the attributes, piling them into a circle or adding them to God, that's what properties or abstract objects are. We've argued here that because of simplicity, what is attributed to God is true of him in total. And this objection holds only if one assumes that the attributes are separate and distinct realities, existing eternally in and of themselves, as opposed to them being the very nature of God. And finally, some object that the Bible ascribes many attributes to God, and even gives him bodily dimensions. Therefore, he cannot be simple. But here we need to understand that bodily dimensions that are used of God 
in scripture are only used as metaphors or anthropomorphisms, that is, to help us better understand spiritual truths. They are not references to God actually possessing dimension or bodily parts. Bodily parts are attributed to God because of his likeness in action, not in his likeness of being. For example, an eye is attributed to God not because he has the organ, such as an eye, but because he sees like an eye, and he sees everything. Furthermore, we could answer that the Bible does attribute certain things to the nature of God that are true of his whole nature, such as the fact that he is love, and God is good, eternal and infinite, and so forth, which he could not be if he actually has bodily dimensions. Aseity comes from the Latin, which means of oneself. Do not confuse aseity with self-caused. Self-causation, or causa sui, is impossible. God is not a caused being. He is an uncaused being. Uh, since he is eternal and necessary, as demonstrated from his pure actuality, he is not dependent on anything for his existence. So he is independent existence, or self-existence. The biblical basis for a seity comes from Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God. God was before all of creation. Hence, he is not dependent on anything that is created. John 1, 3, through him all things were made, without him nothing was made that has been made. And Romans eleven thirty six says, for from him and through him and to him are all things. In Colossians 1, 17, he is before all things. So God is completely independent from creation since he is the creator. And therefore, he has the attribute of aseity or self-existence. Theologically, we can argue from pure actuality, and you'll notice as we go through the theological basis for all the metaphysical attributes, all of them hinge on the notion of pure actuality. They're all grounded in pure actuality, which is, of course, grounded and demonstrated in our prolegomena. God, as pure act, has no potentiality not to exist. It's impossible for God to go out of existence. What has no potentiality for non-existence must exist in and of itself, that is, be self-existent. Therefore, God is self-existent or has a seity. Necessity means literally essential or indispensable. Theologically, God is a being whose existence is essential, a being whose non-existence is impossible, uh, whose essence is to exist where there is no distinction between his essence and existence, they're identical. Hence, God is necessity or necessary existence. God is also immutable. God's nature and will cannot change. It doesn't mean merely that God's purposes do not change, but literally the very nature and will of God cannot change. The biblical basis for immutability is found in Numbers 23.19. God is not a man that he should lie nor a son of man, that he should change his mind. God is not a natural kind found in the world. He's not a man. The nature of a man can undergo change. The will of a man can undergo change. But the will and mind of God cannot undergo any change. 1 Samuel 15, 29 He who is the glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind, for he is not a man, that he should change his mind. Malachi 3.16, I, the Lord, do not change, so you, O descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. And Titus 1.2, resting on the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time. And James 1.17, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like a shifting shadow. So both the Old Testament and the New Testament affirm in teaching about the nature of God that it is immutable and does not change. So you might wonder, well, what do we do with verses that seem to suggest that God changes, such as his repentance or his anger? Well, in these verses, they must be taken as metaphors or anthropomorphic descriptions of God, as we've already discussed, are found throughout Scripture. The theological argument for God's immutability follows from his pure actuality. God is pure act. Pure act has no potentiality. 
Whatever changes has potentiality to change. Therefore, God cannot change. There are some implications with regards to God's immutability. Understood in the science of theology, God's will cannot change. What he wills, he wills from eternity to happen. Again, he's not a creature to be found in the world in which his will and mind would change. It follows from this that his purposes cannot change. What he purposes to happen will happen. And nothing a creature does can change God in any way. We cannot affect or change the nature of God. And if things seem to change for us, it has nothing to do with a change in God's nature. It also follows, God cannot break his unconditional promises. As we will see when we study eschatology and other portions of doctrine, God has a covenant with man. Some of them are unconditional. And those covenants cannot be broken or undone. God must fulfill them since they are unconditional and God's nature does not change. God is eternal or eternality. God is non-temporal or he is timelessness, that is E, not temporal. Eternity excludes any time limitations from God. Time is a succession of measured moments and most think of eternity as a duration without beginning or without end. Hence, eternity is seen as endless time, but this is an incorrect concept. This is an inadequate view of eternality. Garigou Lagrange defines eternality here in this quote as an everlasting present. Even if time were endless, because it is a measurement of moments, there is always a before and after when we think of time like this. Again, that's the wrong concept. Here, Garigou Lagrange clarifies it for us. If then to define the divine eternity as a duration without either beginning or end is inadequate, what is it? The answer of theology is that it is a duration without either beginning or end, but with this very distinctive characteristic that in it there is no succession either of past or future, but an everlasting present. And the correct concept to have with regards to eternality is not an endless duration of time, but an ever-present now, or an eternal now, of which there's no past and future in God. God doesn't think one thing and then think another thing. God doesn't do one thing and then do another thing. Those are all categories that we put creatures in. But God is not a creature. God is eternal and hence he is without time or successive moments. The biblical basis for this is found in Exodus 3.14 that we've looked at, that God is pure existence or pure I amness, expressed in Hebrew terms, I am who I am. Psalm 92 says, Before the mountains were born, you brought or you brought forth the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting you are God. Here's a clear expression in the Psalms of God's eternality. 1 Corinthians 2.7 says, no, Now we speak of God's secret wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. 2 Timothy 1.9, This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. So here, these verses in the New Testament speak of God being outside and before even the existence of time. Titus 1.2, God who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time. In Jude 25, he says, Now to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. The theological basis of God's eternality, again, is from pure actuality. God is pure actuality. Pure actuality has no potentiality. Whatever is temporal has potentiality. Hence, God is not temporal. There are some important implications with regards to God's eternality. God, as we've already indicated, because he is eternal, can have no past or no future. There is only a present now, or what we might refer to as God as an eternal now, with no successive moments or duration whatsoever. God, so we must therefore understand also with regards to this that God doesn't foresee the future. 
he sees it in his present eternal now. He sees everything as an eternal now. What we know as the past or the present or the future, God knows in his eternality, all of it simultaneously. Perhaps this can best illustrate uh, this. Here we are in time only knowing the present, having memories of the past, and not knowing the future. But it's God that sees all of time from beginning and end, not as we see or understand from a past, present, and future context, but from eternity, completely removed from temporal existence. God knows everything, again, in the eternal present now. God is also impassable. Impassibility, the root comes from not passable or passion. God has no passions or suffering. Hence, God is unable to undergo any passion or suffering. The biblical basis for impassibility is an inference from his immutability, since God does not change. I, the Lord, God, I, the Lord, do not change. Malachi 3, 6. 1 Chronicles 29, 14. Everything comes from you, and we have given you only what comes from your hand. Job 22, 2 through 3, can a man be a benefit to God? Can even a wise man benefit him? What pleasure would it give the Almighty if you were righteous? What would he gain if you were all if you were blameless? In Romans eleven thirty five thirty six, who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. In Acts 17.25, and he is not served by human hands, as if he needed anything, because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. All of these verses speak of humans not being able to contribute anything back to God. This implies that God cannot undergo change with regards to his feelings or passions. Nothing can add something to God. Nothing can move him in a changing sense such that he has passions or feelings that would change like a creature does. Hence, God is impassable, which is an implication of his immutability. The argument goes as follows. Impassibility follows from his absolute perfection, which is, of course, an inference from his pure actuality. Passion involves a desire for what is lacking. But God lacks nothing. He is absolutely perfect so God cannot have passions. We have passions because we lack something. We lack good feelings, or we lack a good condition, or we lack good circumstances. God, of course, lacks nothing. Therefore, he has no passions. Now, you might say, does this mean that God does not have feelings? And there are at least two camps with regards to this among classical theologians. There are some that says that God can still have feelings, even though he be impassable. But the feelings need to be understood in this camp, uh, they would put forth, that feelings need to be understood in a sense that is completely different from human feelings, because obviously we can only conceive of feelings as changing emotions. But in God, because he is immutable and impassable, if God has feelings, that means that they must be unchangeable feelings. They're not feelings in any sense that can be affected or changed by the creature. God does not change when we repent, this view would say. We're the ones that undergo the change. And when we repent as sinners, we come under another unchangeable attribute of God. In this view, it could be illustrated this way, that God can have perception, a sensitivity, mercy, and be completely unchanging. These are things that could be related to God's unchanging feelings or eternal feelings. But we cannot say, in this view, that God has passion, that God has sentimentality, that God has misery, or that God, in any sense, undergoes change. Another view, held by some classical theologians, says that impassibility does entail that God does not have feelings. This view says that feelings, as we understand them, are completely related to our soul-body unity. And when we do anthropology, we'll explore this in more detail, but there is a close and tight relationship with regards to soul and body, such that feelings exist for us only because we're a soul-body unity, and that which has no soul-body unity 
because feelings are attached to it, would not have feelings in any sense. God doesn't have a soul-body unity, therefore God does not have feelings. So if God has unchanging feelings, they must be equivocal or totally different than ours, something which we cannot even comprehend. Now, God can still have complete knowledge or understanding of our feelings. In fact, he knows them since he knows everything, as we'll see in omniscience. He knows them even better than we know them. But he does not experience them the way that we experience them. Infinity. This means that God is not finite. That God is limitless in his being without boundaries. This is the attempt to exclude all limitations from God. He is beyond the limitations of the created universe. And this should not be confused with the mathematical infinite. We'll clarify that when we do our theological basis. The biblical basis for infinity, Genesis 1.1, again, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Again, being a phrase for all of creation, since he is before all of creation, he's not limited by creation, since he is the creator. Psalm 147.5 says, Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit, or could just as well be translated as infinite. Job 11.7-9, through 9, Can you probe the limits of the Almighty? They are higher than the heavens. What can you do? They are deeper than the depths of the grave. What can you know? Their measure is longer than the earth and wider than the sea. Here is a clear attempt to say that God is not limited by anything in creation. Hence, he is unlimited or infinite. Romans 11.33 Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out! In Colossians 1.17 he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Hence, God, according to the Bible, is without limits, or not limited by anything in creation, and therefore is infinite. The theological basis, infinity, flows directly from pure actuality. Pure actuality has no potent potency. Potency is what limits actuality, hence pure actuality has no limits. God, as we've said, is infinite because his being is not given to him by another. We are finite because our being is given to us by another. We are given finite existence from another. Our form limits our matter to be this kind of being that is a human being and not some other kind of matter is what limits us to this particular kind versus that particular kind. My matter limits me to being me and your matter limits you to being you. Hence, form and matter limits our capacity to be something. We're located in a specific space at a specific time. We have intelligence or intellect, and terms are described with regards to our limitation. But God is absolute infinity, and this should be distinguished from two other kinds of infinity. God, again, is absolute infinity. But this needs to be opposed to a potential infinite. For example, we could think of taking a marble slab and cutting it in an infinite number of ways. There are all kinds of ways that we could cut a marble slab. And this is what we refer to as a potential infinite. But God is not a potential infinite. There's no amount with respect to God's being. There are no future possibilities with respect to God's being. God's being cannot be increased or diminished in any way. Another kind of infinite that God is not is a numerical infinite. The infinity of God should not be akin to numerical infinite. Numbers can be multiplied seemingly forever, but this is still an amount. Numbers concern amounts, but God's infinity is an actual infinite or an absolute infinite in that it has no amount and it can't correspond to the multiplication of numbers. God's infinity transcends mathematical infinities that we might conceive of in our mind. So in summary, God is absolute infinity, or we might say an actual infinite, as opposed to a potential infinite 
or a numerical infinite. God is immaterial or immateriality. Literally, he is not material or non-material. Theologically, God is immaterial or pure spirit. Matter can be understood philosophically and scientifically. Philosophically, it's understood as that which has extension in space, having part outside of part. And scientifically, it could be understood as physical energy, everything that is subject to the second law of thermodynamics. But God is immateriality. Neither of these apply to him. God is not understood as materially in a philosophical or a scientific sense. He has no extension in space or time or mass or physical energy or force. Instead, as John 4.24 says, God is spirit or immateriality. God is immensity. Literally means that God is not measurable. Since God is immateriality, he can't be measured. He has no physical or spatial dimensions. The definition of God is that he is not measurable. He is unlimited in his extension since he is non-spatial. God is not spatial. He should not be identified or identical with any space. And God is not limited by space. Now, we do need to clarify that he is certainly, as we get to omnipresence, he is present everywhere. And he is, and all of him is present everywhere. But there's a difference between him being present everywhere and him, and him being identified with the space-time universe. He's not identical to space and time. He is not part of the created universe, and he's not limited by the created universe. Hence, he has immensity and cannot be measured. Omnipotence. Omnipotence means omni, all, and potent, or powerful. Hence, God is all-powerful. Power is the ability of doing, and it is a perfection that is attributable to the very nature of God. God's power is perfect, it's identical with his very essence. God's power is infinite, that is, it's not an amount of infinite, as if it can be measured, but it's absolutely infinite. God's power is also absolutely free, that is, there's nothing outside of God that forces him to do anything. God can use his power freely. And God is almighty, that is, he can do all things. God can do whatever is possible to do, and God can do what is not impossible to do. And it's important to understand that there's nothing that affects God's power. Nothing created affects God's power, and nothing can lessen his infinite power or take away from it. And also, God's freedom is not like our freedom. God's will does not result from reflection and desire such as human will does. But instead, God is free to create, since there is nothing in his nature or anything outside his nature that is influencing him or forcing him to do something. The Biblical Basis for Omnipotence, Job 11.7 Can you discover the depths of God? Can you discover the limits of the Almighty? If he passes by or shuts up? or calls an assembly, who can restrain him? For he knows false men, and he sees iniquity without investigating. Psalm 24, 8, Who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Jeremiah 32, 17, O Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power, and your outstretched arm, nothing is too difficult for you. And Luke 1, 37, for nothing will be impossible with God. Matthew 3, 9, and Do not suppose that you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from these stones, God is able to raise up children to Abraham. The theological basis for omnipotence comes from pure actuality. God has no potentiality. He's only pure actuality. What has no potentiality has no limits at all. Hence, God has no limits at any kind. But to not have all power would be a limit. Hence, God is unlimited in his power. So what does it not mean? What do we not mean by omnipotence? For one, God cannot contradict his nature. So part of his power can't possibly be anything that contradicts his nature. For example, he can't use his power to go out of existence. That would be impossible. Also, God cannot do contradictory things. A contradictory thing 
however, is not really a thing at all. It is fiction. It is thought with no actuality of existence. And something that is contradictory are when two elements cancel each other out, leaving nothing at all. And that's why, again, it's fictional or non-existent. For example, he cannot make square circles, not because he lacks any power to do it, but because square circles isn't anything at all. A square circle is a circle that is not a circle. It's nothing whatsoever. So it is really a meaningless question to ask if God can do something that is contradictory. Second, he cannot force freedom. He works persuasively, but never coercively. God, as we'll see later on, is the efficient causation of us being able to be free. And his moral attributes would prevent him from interfering with free will. And his omnipotence would guarantee that he always preserves free will. And third, God does not have to do all that he can do. Just because God is omnipotent doesn't mean he has to use all of his power all the time. God is free not to use his omnipotence. That is, God is free to limit the use of his power, but he is not free to limit the extent of his power. For example, he can't decide not to be omnipotent anymore. This should give us assurance that when God says something, it will come about, or he will follow through and do it especially with respect to things such as fulfilled prophecy. When God makes a prediction, it will come about. This should give us an assurance that God's promises and God's prophecies will ultimately be fulfilled. God lacks nothing with regards to his knowledge and lacks nothing with regards to his power. So when God says something, promises something, it will ultimately come to pass. Some have proposed some problems that seem to challenge the notion of omnipotence. Problem number one, can God make a rock too heavy for him to lift? But this question is really a category mistake. It's like asking, is there anything more powerful than the all-powerful? And of course, the answer is no. Since God is all-powerful, whatever God makes, he can move. Whatever he can create, he can destroy and recreate again in another place. That is all power. And you can't have more power than the all-powerful. It's true that God cannot make another infinite, since he alone is infinite and eternal. But he can make anything that is finite, and he can move anything that is finite. And that is being omnipotent or having all power. Hence, God can do anything that is not impossible, and that's what we mean by omnipotence. The second problem concerns evil. If God is all-powerful, why does he not defeat evil? First, we need to identify the fact that evil is not a substance or a thing that God directly creates. Evil is a privation, as Augustine tells us. That is, it's a lack of good in essentially good things. It's a privation to substances that exist. And it either exists in terms of evil suffered or evil done. Evil suffered concerns a concomitant of created things that interact with one another. Or evil done concerns moral evil or choices. God is not directly responsible for either of these. It can go, our response can go like this. An all-good God would defeat evil. And an all-powerful God can defeat evil. God is both all-good and all-powerful, and the fact that evil still exists means that at some point in our future, evil will ultimately be defeated, because again, God can do it, and God will do it. It's just the fact that right now, it's not done. Omnipresence means that God is everywhere present, or there's nowhere that God is absent from. Now, we do need to make some qualifications on this, because this could tend to lead to two errors if we're not careful. And the first qualification is this. We're not saying this in a pantheism-type sense. That is, we are not saying that God is creation. That creation, the material creation, and God are the same, 
It's also the case that we could lead to panentheism with regards to this doctrine, and we certainly don't want to do that. We're not saying that God is in, in the sense that he is identical with creation. That would be panentheism. Meaning of omnipresent. By this we mean that all of God, his entire simplicity, is everywhere at once. God does not have parts, so he can't have one part here and another part there because he's simple. He doesn't have any parts. God is present too, but again, he's not part of or in creation in the sense of being identified with creation. God is everywhere, but he is not identical to anything. God is at every point in space, but he is not spatial. He is at every point in space, but he's not identical to any point in space. I can't point at the table or the chair and say, that is God. But I can say that all of God is everywhere. God is the universe as its cause, according to Colossians 1.17. And the universe is the effect. But again, he's not identical with it or a part of it. So again, we can say that all of God is everywhere, yet we cannot say that part of him is anywhere, since, again, he has no parts and is simple. The biblical basis for omnipresence, 1 Kings 8.27, But will God really dwell on earth? The heavens, even the highest heaven, cannot contain you, how much less this temple I have built. In Psalm 139, 7-10, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. Here, expressed in human language, is the fact that humans cannot get away from the presence of God because he is everywhere present at once. In Acts 17, 27 through 28, Paul says, God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. The theological argument for omnipresence comes from simplicity, which is grounded in pure actuality. God has no parts, since he is simple. What has no parts cannot be partly anywhere. Hence, God is not partly anywhere. Hence, he must be wholly everywhere. To further clarify our theological understanding of omnipresence, we need to understand that God is the sustaining cause that is, the action and effect of all of creation, or the actuality of all of creation and all of its movement. This is the distinguishing mark between theism and deism. Most people, when they study this attribute, only see that God is present everywhere, or present to everything, and God just knows all that's going on. But the classical theistic understanding is that God is much more than that to creation. He is, in fact, the agent and the efficient cause of all action and effects, or all movement that takes place in creation. So God is completely present everywhere in creation and is the agent or efficient cause of all existence and movement of that existence. And that is because we, or creation itself, cannot be the actuality of ourselves, since it is not of our essence to exist. That must come from someone else, and of course, that is God. And this is implied, of course, in God's omnipresence. God is omnipresent in everything and in every place. That's proper to be said in a classical theistic context. And of course, we don't mean that in a pantheistic way or a panentheistic way. We don't mean to say that God is in everything and in every place in terms of being identical with it. But he is wholly there as its efficient or agent cause of all action, effect, and movement that takes place in creation. 
God is entirely present to everything and every place. And God alone is omnipresent. Nothing else can fit into this classification or this category. The implications of this is that nothing acts independently of God. If something moves in the created world or changes in the created world, not only is God present to that movement or motion, whether it be an atom or a subatomic particle, all the way to the galaxies that fill the universe. Nothing moves independently of God. God is in all things, but again, not in the sense of being identical with those things or in the sense of being extension in space. He is in all things in terms of his power, his presence, and his providence. Some objections are sometimes raised with regards to omnipresence. Some will say that if God is everywhere, causally, as I've identified in the previous theological description, then he is the cause of evil, some will say. Here we can reply that God creates all things metaphysically good, as we'll see when we cover creation with respect to Genesis 1 and 2. However, as I've pointed out before, evil should not be thought of as a thing or a being or a substance that happens to be in a place. Instead, evil is a privation, which comes from Augustine's thinking on it. That is, a privation is a lack in being, or a lack of goodness where it should be, which is often the result of free will. Hence, we can speak of God as the efficient causation, which makes evil possible, but not the choosing. God makes my evil choices possible. He even guarantees that they are free and that they occur because of his omnipotence and his omnipresence. And as I choose, he again guarantees that my choices are filled out as the efficient cause of my free will. But he does not make my evil choices for me. They are my choices. And therefore, he does not bear the responsibility of them. I bear the responsibility of them. Here are some illustrations that are often used for omnipresence. First, a bad one, that God is like the air. This is a bad illustration because, first of all, air isn't everywhere. There are some places that air is not, so this fails to illustrate it properly. Some better illustrations are as, for example, a mind is to the brain. The brain, of course, being the organ that is in my head. And everywhere that my brain is, my mind functions, being the immaterial aspect of my brain. Or we could use this, beauty to a work of art. Everywhere that a work of art is, a painting for example, there is beauty that comes forth from it. And then we could also use as a thought is to a sentence. As I can say a sentence or I can write a sentence, there the thought exists as well in an immaterial sense. And everywhere that the sentence is, either being spoken or written, the thought exists as well, which can be extracted from the sentence. These would be better illustrations with regards to omnipresence. Omniscience means all, and science meaning no, so this is all-knowing. The meaning of this is that God's knowledge is the same as his essence. Since God is infinite and has no limits, therefore his knowledge has no limits or is infinite. God knows all things because he knows himself. God knows all things more perfect than creatures can know. Creatures are limited in their knowledge and know things imperfectly. God, of course, is unlimited in his knowledge and knows everything perfectly. God's knowledge is also not discursive. Our knowledge is discursive. Our knowledge occurs one after another. I know one thing, and then I know another thing, and there has to be some sequence to it. But in God, there's no sequence of knowledge. God knows everything again in his eternal now. And God is identical with his knowledge. God knows all things, past, present, and future, in an eternal now. God knows even the possible things that have never been, nor ever will be, and that is because they exist potentially in his power to create. God knows future contingents. God knows all persons, what they will do and not do, what they will think and what they won't think. And of course, he knows all things that are contingent upon free will and circumstances. Hence, there are no limits to what God knows. The biblical basis for omniscience, 
Psalm 147, 5, His understanding is infinite, great is our Lord, and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. Job 36, 4, His understanding is perfect. Be assured that my words are not false. One perfect in knowledge is with you. And Isaiah 46, 10, He knows the end from the beginning. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times what is still to come. I say my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. So here expressed in everyday language is the omniscience of God. The theological basis for omniscience is grounded in pure actuality. God is pure actuality. Pure actuality is no potentiality. Potentiality is a limitation in his being. Hence, God has no limitations in his being. But God's knowledge is part of his being. Hence, God has no limitations in his knowledge. What omniscience does not mean. It does not mean that God's knowledge is merely greater than our knowledge. It also does not mean that God's knowledge is merely the greatest actual knowledge of any being. It is the greatest possible knowledge of any being. Again, God knows all things that will come about and will not come about. There's no limit to what God knows. God cannot know what is impossible to know, because again, the impossible or the contradictory is not real, it's fictitious. He cannot know what a square circle is, because a square circle isn't anything at all. And he cannot know that good is evil, or evil is good. Here are some problems with respect to omniscience, and in dealing with this first problem, that is, does omniscience eliminate freedom? In answering this, our answer to this question will serve as the basis for how we understand Scripture with respect to freedom later on when we deal with issues regarding salvation. So it's very important to see how we solve this particular issue or this particular problem. In our theology proper, all of our theology flows out of our theology proper and helps us to understand the rest of Scripture. It actually informs us how to interpret certain things that we'll find in Scripture. So some will say that omniscience eliminates freedom. But God is eternal and knows all in his eternal now. Again, there's no advance or future or past in God. It's an eternal now, and it contains all that he knows. And because that's the case, we can speak of an act being both free and determined. However, we need to understand what we mean by the word determined. Determined needs to be understood in a fixed sense, that something will happen because God will be the efficient causation of that thing to happen, or the agent cause of that thing to happen, not because he will force it to happen. If we understand determined in a forced sense, then there are contradictions in God's very nature. God does not force things to happen against free will. But since God can know for sure what we will freely do, he can so determine or fix things to occur in accordance with our free choices. Again, not based on our free choices and not forcing our free choices, but in accordance with all of our free choices. So here God stands from eternity knowing all the free choices that all human beings will do, and through his efficient causation, enables and ensures that they all freely do happen and take place, and so determines or fix all things to occur in accordance with those free choices. God can't know what we are forced to do freely. That makes no sense, since forced freedom is actually a contradiction, or not a thing that can occur. Let me give you a few illustrations with regards to this notion of in accordance with that I've used to understand freedom and determinism. We can find instances in our temporal world where things are determined and free. Let me give you an illustration. If I put on a tie to go and teach, I choose the tie freely out of the closet, and I put it on, and I go to teach. That was a free choice that I made to put this tie versus all the other ties that are in my closet. And yet, it is a choice that is determined or fixed as well, in the sense that I can never make that choice again. 
Now I certainly can go back home and get another tie on and make another choice, but I'm talking about the first choice that I made. There's no way I can ever do that choice over again since it's fixed or determined. Yet, at the same time, I freely chose one tie over another tie. Hence, even in our temporal world, we see that there are choices we make that are both free and determined. Things are determined in accordance with our free choices. So even in the temporal world, we find instances where things are determined, if determined is understood in a fixed sense and not a forced sense. So how much more God from eternity is able to know all the free choices that humans will make, ensure their freedom by his agent causation, and determine all that occurs in the world in accordance with those free choices. Again, not basing them on the free choices and not forcing anything against the free choices, but doing it in accordance with the free choices. And this, of course, will become very important in a description of freedom and determinism that I will rely on when we deal with issues in soteriology and other doctrines as well. Problem number two is fatalism. Does omniscience lead to fatalism? Not so. It does matter what I do since I am free, and God, of course, is the agent cause of my freedom. And free beings, of course, are responsible. God ensures that my freedom is possible and actual, but again, he doesn't make my choices for me. I make my choices, and God doesn't bear the responsibility of my choices. I bear the responsibility for them. And just because it is determined, and of course I use determined in a fixed sense, not in a forced sense, does not mean it isn't free. We just discussed the differences between that. Further, we usually do not know what God has determined, that is fixed, before we choose it. We don't know the future, but God does know the future in terms of all the free choices that will be made and all that he has determined to happen. So, if we indeed freely choose something, this is what God knows, or foreknew, and I use that in an anthropomorphic sense, would happen. So, we really are free with respect to our choosing. As I mentioned before, God is the efficient or agent cause of our free will, and He alone has the power to preserve our free will and to carry it out. And of course, he doesn't make the choice for us since it is my choice to make. So this is not fatalism, and omniscience does not lead to fatalism. God is omnisapience. Omnisapience refers to the wisdom of God. Omnisapience means that God knows the best means to the best of all possible ends. Sapience means having or showing great wisdom or sound judgment. Theologically, it means wisdom is God's unerring ability to choose the best means to accomplish the best ends. And since God knows, through his omniscience, what the best means is to the best of all possible ends, his omnisapience will be carried out throughout all of creation. Job 12.13 says, To God belong wisdom and power, counsel and understanding are his. So God is omnisapience. God is also beauty personified. Beauty is that which, being perceived, pleases. And God is the personification of beauty. Beauty needs to be understood as something that is objective. That is, it is in the thing itself. And the fact that beauty is objective is actually something that's quite easy to prove to people. If I were to show you a work of art, say a very expensive one, a Picasso, or something that is recognized as one of the greatest works of art that there is, and I brought in a paint can of pink paint and started to paint over it, one of the things that you would immediately recognize is that the painting that I painted over part of is now less beautiful than it was. Well, if it's less beautiful than what it was, then beauty must be something that is objective or in the thing, and not something that is subjective in the person. So beauty, being objective, is the central attribute of goodness that produces in the beholder a sense of overwhelming pleasure and delight. 
And of course, beauty is related to his holiness and goodness that we will discuss under his moral attributes. And the beauty of God, which is objective, is something that we will see in the beatific vision. That is the ultimate aesthetic experience of seeing spiritually infinite beauty. God is life and immortality, literally without death, immortal or imperishable, incorruptible. 1 Timothy 6.16 says, God alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see. It is more than deathlessness, but a quality of life enjoyed as death is completely swallowed up, as 2 Corinthians 5.4 says. Theologically, God possesses life intrinsically and eternally, as we've discussed in his aseity and eternality. God is life itself. Everything else merely has life or is given life by the source of life, which is God alone. And finally, God is unity. This refers to the oneness of God. There is one and only one God. Unity entails that there cannot be more than one God. There cannot be two gods or more than one God. It also entails simplicity, that there are no two parts or more with respect to God. And it entails that the Trinity must really be understood as a tri-unity, that there are three persons in the one God. There is a biblical basis for unity to explore. Deuteronomy 6.4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Isaiah 45.18, I am the Lord, and there is no other. 1 Corinthians 8.4, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other than God but one. 1 Timothy 2.5, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ. Theological basis for unity is the fact that God is pure act, and there cannot be more than one pure act. This we've argued against in our prolegomena, since that which is pure act is infinite. The implication of this is that there is only one true God should be worshipped. Hence, anything else that is worshipped is a false God, being something found in the created world, something that is composed, such as idolatry, animism, or polytheism. Hence, anything else other than the one true God should not be worshipped. Uh, Louis D. Molina, 1535-1600, you can find his writing concerning this issue in his book On Divine Foreknowledge, was a uh, Spanish Jesuit, and his expression of his view, as you can see, rose well after the time of Thomas Aquinas, and is opposed to Aquinas' view, or the Dominican order, which of course follows Thomas Aquinas. Today, both Thomists and Calvinists would oppose his particular view. However, there are some philosophers as well as theologians, perhaps more or some of the Arminian persuasion, and there are some Roman Catholics that tend to favor his view. And shortly after his death, around 1607, the Roman Catholic Church did allow both views to exist within the Church. To understand Molinism, we must understand that there are three kinds of knowledge. These three kinds of knowledge consist of one, natural knowledge. Natural knowledge consists of necessary and possible things. God's knowledge consists of all the possible worlds that could exist and what is necessary and possible in all of them. And this, for example, would include things such as the law of logic. The laws of logic are necessary because they come from the nature of God. They're not something willed or something that God decides to be the case, but instead they're true because of God's nature. That is, they are necessary. We're going to skip the second kind of knowledge, which is referred to as middle knowledge, and jump to the third kind of knowledge. The third kind of knowledge is free knowledge of absolute contingence. This is knowledge of this actual world which God knows absolutely what things would be true and false. An example of this would be Abraham Lincoln either exists or he does not exist. And if he exists, then certain things are true with regards to what Abraham Lincoln does. But if he does not exist in this world, say God does not have Abraham Lincoln exist in this world, then the things that Abraham Lincoln would do 
that are true in this world, if he did exist, would indeed be false. What is true and false in the world, if Abraham Lincoln does not exist, then statements about what he did would, of course, be false if he does not exist in this world. God, of course, must have this kind of knowledge, but it is different knowledge dependent on whether he makes Abraham Lincoln exist in this world or not exist in this world. Most Thomists or Calvinists would not have an objection to these kinds of knowledge. They might object to the way that they've been stated or some of the vocabulary that is used, but in the end, they would not object to this kind of knowledge, since either it's necessary knowledge extending from God's nature, or it's necessary knowledge extending from what God decides to do or wills to do with regards to the world. Either way, God knows it all, but it's the middle knowledge that Molinism comes up with that Calvinists and Thomists do have difficulty with. Middle knowledge may also be known as intermediate knowledge, or older texts might refer to it as futurables, and it is distinctive to Molinism. Middle knowledge, also referred to as scientia media, says that God cannot know future free acts the way that he knows necessary knowledge and free knowledge. Middle knowledge is something that God can know contingently since it is dependent in some sense on what free creatures choose to do. For example, this one comes from Dr. William Lane Craig's book, Only Wise God. He says, God knew, referring to his natural knowledge, in the first moment, all the possible things that Peter could do if placed in such circumstances. But now in the second moment, he knows what Peter would, in fact, freely choose to do under such circumstances. So it's important to point out in this that in the first moment, he didn't know what Peter would choose that's only in the second moment, hence making God contingent on what Peter chooses in the second moment. Directly from Molina himself, he states, if the created free will were to do the opposite of what it did, as it truly can do, God would have known the very act by the same knowledge, but not that he actually knows it. Now, this is not seen by Molinus to compromise God's omniscience, that is, his all-knowingness, since this kind of knowledge is not knowable until the free creature chooses or wills it, and it becomes actual. And it's also important to point out that middle knowledge, as understood by Molinus, is logically prior to the divine decision to create. In other words, it's not chronological or sequential. Something that is sequential or chronological is when one thing occurs before another thing. But instead, this is understood to be a logical order. This is simply something that explains something else. The way the premises in an argument are logically prior to the conclusion, though temporally speaking, the argument is simultaneously true. And it's also important to understand that the free agent, or in this case with the example Peter, is not causally determined by circumstances or anything else. He truly is free in the decision that he makes. But it is this decision that the free agent, or Peter, makes that God is dependent on with regards to coming to knowledge of. God doesn't know it in the first moment, but knows it in the second moment. And this is what Thomists have a problem with. As Garrigou Lagrange says here, we have a point of greatest difficulty. So what are the arguments that a Molinist put forward? Well, they do uh, philosophical, theological, as well as biblical uh, arguments for their particular view of middle knowledge. So let's look at just a few of them. The first one, they would say that there are three kinds of knowledge correspond to the three kinds of state of affairs that we find in the world. So this being the case, that there are three different states of affairs in our world that we can point to, it corresponds that this must be three kinds of knowledge of which God knows as well. That is, there are possible states of affair, and there are necessary states of affair, and in between these, there are contingent or free states of affairs. Since God knows all, he must know them as they are, that is, future, free, and contingent, uh, the middle knowledge being reliant or dependent on the creature's free will. They also put forth a logical 
argument for their view by saying that no being can know truth, what is not yet knowable with regards to truth. So God must wait in a logical sense for the occurrence of free acts before they are actually true. And second, they'll point to the theological explanatory power of this. Uh, since it seems to avoid fatalism, since it explains free will, that some things happen contingently, and hence we are truly free, and fatalism uh, would not follow. It also seems to help explain the notion of predestination, since before the creation, God does not know who will be saved, and also as a consequence, who will be lost. Hence, he is or becomes dependent on the free will choice of human beings to predestine those who will be saved and those who will be lost. And there also seems to be some a biblical suggestion or evidence uh, of this notion of middle knowledge in, in the scripture as well. Matthew eleven twenty through 24, in verse 21, uh, it is Jesus who cites the cities of Chorazin and Bethsidia, and says, for if the miracles had occurred in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. So here it is God expressing knowledge about would what would have happened to certain cities that he mentions if the gospel had been preached to them, and if miracles had been done to them. This seems to be an expression of what didn't happen, but God has knowledge of what would have happened had certain things been done, such as the gospel and miracles being done for those cities. So these are the philosophical, theological, as well as the biblical type arguments and examples that are used with regards to arguments for Molinism, which again purports a middle knowledge. So just briefly, a critique of Molinism. A Thomist, I think, would reply that it simply is overall not a necessary distinction to make. Uh, God knows all that which is necessary and contingent in his nature from eternity, and he knows it independently, not dependent on anything in time, and certainly not dependent on creatures in time. All things pre-exist in God as their ultimate efficient cause. Hence, he does not wait for anything. God's knowledge corresponds to his nature. Hence, he cannot be dependent on anything to happen in creation. Just because an event is certain, fixed, or we might even use the term determined to happen by God, does not mean it cannot freely occur. Since God knows all things, and whatever God knows is determined to come to pass in accordance with, but not dependent on, the free choice of human being. And second, the theological mysteries that it seems to explain can also be explained with regards to not having anything contingent or dependency in God's knowledge. God can know with necessity what would have happened if people chose differently. That certainly is in the power of God's knowledge and assumed in the notion of omniscience. But Thomas will point to some consequences if one does follow Molinism, and this is why Thomas do not follow Molinism. Uh, first of all, and this is no small thing, if we follow Molinism consistently, then we have to believe that God is a passive recipient of knowledge with regards to free acts. God's middle knowledge then is dependent on free acts that produce knowledge or truth that God does not know until the free choice or free act is made. The problem with this, carried out to its logical conclusion, makes God a dependent being. And if it makes God a dependent being, then it is a denial of God's pure actuality or complete independence regarding his knowledge. And denial of pure actuality, as you should know by now, is no small thing. Denying his pure actuality makes God not the ultimate being in the universe and not the first cause of all creation. In fact, in this view, God becomes an effect as opposed to the ultimate cause. We must come to grips with the fact that God's knowledge is either completely causal, determining all events in accordance with free will, or it is determined by the events that take place in creation. Even if it's just one event, there is no third option. And if Molinism says 
He is determined by events, future free contingencies that are chosen by creatures. Then the very nature of God is compromised, and it is a denial of his pure actuality as well as his other metaphysical attributes. And also, third, uh, Thomas will point out uh, that Molinism is not really a theological science, or we might say a theological system. That is, it doesn't start or proceed from certain undeniable principles or certain universal truths to an elaborate doctrinal system that attempts to explain all in terms of God and creation. Instead, Molinism starts with an objection to a solution and then proposes a solution that ultimately ends up denying something that is fundamental about the nature of God, namely that he is pure actuality, that God is the first cause of all things in creation, that God is the first cause of creation and not dependent on any of his effects. This ultimately does not imply a mystery, but a contradiction. And this is directly opposed to Thomism, which is a theological science in which it scientifically elaborates a doctrine beginning with universal principles and arriving at conclusions by a legitimate reasoning process. So I think these are uh, valid criticisms of Molinism and also uh, consequences if one follows Molinism consistently. So you might be asking, well, what is the Thomistic response to uh, the issue regarding future contingents. So the question, how does God know infallibly from eternity free conditioned futures? But first understand that it's the middle ground between that which is purely possible and absolute that Molinism is pointing to and questioning with regards to the dependency of God's knowledge. That is the middle ground between the purely possible and the absolute future. And the key thing that Molinism is missing or not appreciating or not understanding in the Thomistic science of theology is this, the notion of knowing in God's divine will. In God's divine will, there are no contingents or secondary causes that are undetermined without his divine will. For example, in Matthew eleven twenty through 24, where Christ says that certain cities would have been converted if the gospel had been preached to them, that situation exists and is known because that is the divine will of God. Had the free creatures had the gospel, they would have repented because that is in the divine will of God. The scriptures also say that God desires all men to be saved. God's antecedent will is to save all of mankind. And this is something that is absolute in God but it is conditional in our time-space universe, meaning God would save all mankind if this did not conflict with his attributes, such as justice, goodness, and love. So it truly is a desire or will of God, we would say, that all mankind be saved. It is just not something that is possible to happen because God does not force or cannot force people into heaven. Aquinas would say that contingent futures, what he would call futurables or middle knowledge, are not knowable in themselves because their truth is not determined. And what Aquinas is saying here is when there's no divine will attached to the futurable, when there's no divine decree with respect to God, and what is going to happen in the world, then there's nothing, then there's no knowledge attached to it. And that seems to be what the Molinist does not understand. If the truth is not determined, then there's nothing concerning contingent futurables that's knowable. So any situation that we would point to or come up with, if there's no attachment to God's divine will or God's divine decrees, then there's nothing to be known and of course, where there's no knowledge, even an omniscient being cannot know what is impossible to know or no knowledge. And again, the reason we would say under X conditions, Peter either will or will not deny the Lord, that situation exists as a contingent, a free contingent, because of God's determination about the matter. So a distinction needs to be made, as the Thomas does, between conditionally free acts of the future 
and things that are purely possible, which are not attached to divine will or decree. And again, that which is not attached to the divine will or decree is no knowledge at all. And as the quote from Thomas Aquinas points out, without a conditional decree or will from God, there is no free conditioned future knowable that's even knowable to God, since it's unknowable, it's non-existent, it's fiction. If there is no divine will decree about the matter, then it remains undetermined and therefore unknowable even to God himself. As uh, Garrigou Lagrange says, Thomism finds that it consists in the efficacy of the divine will, which is able infallibly to move or will to choose freely, inasmuch as the divine will extends even to the free mode of our choice, actualizing but not destroying our free will.